Men det är kort ett bit om Alexander och Nikita som skulle kolla. Alexander och Nikita som skulle kolla. Det är inte en jobb att vara på. Det är inte en jobb att vara på. Det är inte en jobb att vara på. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to this science and mathematics teaching and learning seminar. Uh, SAMTOL, which is, uh, of course, means uh, sort of discussion or talk in, in Swedish, so that's why it's called what it is called. Uh, today, we're uh, very pleased to have a special guest from Singapore with us. Uh, and that's why it's uh, being done over Zoom today. Uh, we've got Stephen Pan here, who is, and I'm reading this, uh, um, the Director of the Learning Sciences Laboratory at the Department of Psychology at the National University of Singapore. Uh, so, uh, Stephen, uh, it's, it's great to, to see you there. Uh, what time is it there now? It's 6 p.m. It's 6 p.m. Okay, so you're, you're working overtime, I guess. Um, so uh, today, um, Stephen's going to talk to us about something called interleaved practice, and I think he'll tell us what that is and how he's uh, used this in physics. Um, so without any more uh, messing about, I think uh, it's uh, time for me to, to leave over to you, Stephen. Wonderful. Thank you for the kind introduction. And first, I just want to check. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah, fine. Okay, great. So I, I thought I would just give you a little context about my own background for sort of just for the first few minutes here. So, okay. Great. So I'm a cognitive psychologist and learning scientist. And in my lab, we're focused on really investigating ways to enhance learning in a variety of different situations. So whether it's learning math, learning physics, learning a second language, a variety of different topics, what are the circumstances? What are the conditions that make that learning more efficient, longer lasting, better in some way? And that learning could occur online, in a classroom, students learning on their own, all sorts of possibilities. So that's a very, very broad overall sort of mission that my lab pursues. And the approaches that we use range from laboratory and online studies to classroom studies, uh, which I'll talk about quite a lot today, synthesizing multiple uh, research literatures, and then finally informing educators about best practices, ways to enhance learning in their own classes, in their own teaching. And the broader framework, theoretically, we can think about the process of learning, you know, before learning, during learning, after learning. We can think about uh, the different faculties, the different mindsets you bring to a learning situation. During learning, there is learning that's being accumulated, presumably over time, that can be more efficient or less efficient, depending on various circumstances. And then after learning has occurred, over time, you may experience forgetting. And then a key question is, what are the conditions that might ward off forgetting and let you preserve what you've learned over a longer period of time? And so the ideal or optimal outcome that uh, I seek to obtain and many other learning scientists seek to obtain is learning that meets a variety of criteria. Optimally, learning should be comprehensive, you should be able to master all the material you're trying to learn, you should be highly proficient in whatever skills you're trying to acquire. And importantly, the learning should be long lasting or durable, it should be retained and accessible in long term memory over days, months, years. And it should be in many cases, flexible to a certain degree. You should be able to apply that learning in a variety of different circumstances. 
certainly for the case of problem solving, for example, in physics, you want to be able to apply what you've learned in the classroom to a variety of perhaps real world problems or other circumstances that might not be exactly the same as the, the circumstances in which you originally learned that information. So that's a sort of broader picture here. And there are a slew of techniques that show some potential at yielding this sort of optimal result. So here are some of the techniques, and depending on the actual technique, they may be implemented at different stages of the learning process. And so, for example, you can ask people questions about information they haven't learned yet, which is known as pre-testing or pre-questions. And there's a growing research showing that's actually quite beneficial for learning. And during learning, there's a slew of techniques that you can use. And one of those is interleave practice, which I'm going to talk about quite a lot in just a few moments, as well as some techniques that might occur after you've learned something, such as receiving feedback. So uh, these all represent on this slide different learning strategies that are highly promising that in my lab we are actively investigating. I'm happy to talk about any of those, but today I'm going to focus on interleave practice, which is a way of scheduling learning, arranging the order in which you learn information. So what is interleave practice and how might it benefit learning? So what is interleave practice or interleaving, as we sometimes call it? What well, helps to really describe what interleaving isn't and contrast it against this more common approach or conventional approach. Uh, it's very common when you schedule learning, whether it's a coach teaching some skills, for example, in the uh, tennis players learning to serve or learning to hit a forehand or backhand, or whether it is uh, learning to play a musical instrument, and you're going to focus on certain chords or certain aspects of that particular instrument. Focusing on one skill or concept at a time is something we call blocking, where we block off chunks of time to focus on one skill or concept at a time. And blocking is really the ubiquitous or default way of scheduling learning in many, many circumstances. So for example, a textbook, you will see you know, chapter one is on this particular topic and it's focused on that. And maybe all the practice questions are on that particular topic. And after you have mastered chapter one, you move on to chapter two, which is on a different topic, chapter three, and so on. If you look at a, you'll also see similar, very, very nice arrangement of we're focusing on one skill or concept at a time. Now that, might be a little bit of oversimplification for some of you. Some of your classes are more complicated in terms of the schedule than that. But blocking is a time-honored, very, very common practice. And there are analyses of textbooks and practice materials that show that this is the most common way to schedule the uh, topics that people learn in many, many different disciplines. So that's what we call blocking, one skill or concept at a time. In opposition to that, so to speak, is interleaving. So interleaving is where rather than focusing on one skill or concept at a time, you are going to jump back and forth between the concepts or skills you're trying to learn. You're interleaving your learning, mixing together, whether it is the presentation of the information or the practice of whatever you're trying to learn, you are not focusing on one skill or concept or at a time you are constantly switching back and forth. And this particular schedule doesn't seem particularly organized to many uh, casual observers or even to instructors you tell them, why don't you interleave your learning? It might seem quite haphazard and not necessarily something you would want to do. But that's what makes it so interesting is that there is now accumulating evidence that interleaving may actually be less uh, useless as what one might think. So much of this evidence comes from laboratory studies involving visual categories. So here are some examples. Learning to identify pictures or paintings that were created by different artists. OK, 
Okay, learning to identify different categories, for example, different species of butterflies or different species of birds. And even in the medical profession, being able to identify different waveforms uh, that represent different, for example, different uh, cardiovascular conditions. These are all examples of visual categories where the learning occurs typically by viewing examples or exemplars of these categories. So for example, you might, in a typical block schedule, you might see 10 pictures or 10 paintings that represent, say, the work of Monet, a famous impressionist. And then you might see 10 examples of some other impressionist. Similarly, in a natural category learning, you might see uh, you know, five or 10 pictures that represent examples of a monarch butterfly and then of another species of butterfly and so on. And that's very, very common approach. But in these laboratory studies, that blocked schedule has been compared to an interleaved schedule where every example that a person sees is from a different category or it's, it's arranged in such a way that there is a constant switching back and forth between different categories. So for the case of paintings, you might see one Monet painting and then one uh, Seurat painting or and then one some other artist painting. You keep switching, switching. And then later on, there is a category uh, identification test. You're given a new painting or a new picture and asked to identify who do you think painted this or uh, what species is this or what waveform is this? And in all of these cases, an interleave schedule resulted in better category learning, better ability to identify a given category after having seen exemplars in this mixed up interleave fashion. And so there was a fairly recent meta-analysis which investigated uh, all the different studies, lab studies that focused on primarily visual category learning, learning from examples or category induction or inductive learning. And they found that across nearly 60 studies, the effect size difference in standard deviation units was a hedges G of 0 0.42. So if you learn visual categories or learn some kind of category, and you use an interleave schedule, you will result, uh, have better performance on a subsequent test about 0.4 standard deviations better than if you had learned using a blocked schedule. So that's the interleaving benefit that has been established thus far, primarily in the case of visual category learning and primarily from laboratory studies, very highly controlled environments, you know, where people come in, are seen in front of the computer, and pictures are flashed on the screen for them to learn from. So why might interleaving be effective for learning? Well, there are two major theoretical accounts. The first one, and this is just a broad overview. The first one is this idea that interleave practice fosters discrimination. And discrimination meaning learning to identify one category from another. Okay, so here you see sort of a schematic of an interleave schedule. And I have arrows here showing the transition from one category to the next, okay? So although these pictures I think show uh, someone learning tennis, but if you imagine you are learning to identify different visual categories, maybe the category A, category C, category B, and so on, you see one picture that is category A, and then the next picture you see is a, say, category C. Because you have just switched categories, that's an opportunity for you to think, okay, what makes category A distinct? And then when you switch to category, the next category, you can also engage in this sort of discriminative contrast process where you start to be able to tell apart one category from the next. So that's one particular uh, leading account of why interleaved practice may benefit learning. There is also a different account which is based on this idea of temporal spacing. So by temporal spacing, uh, we're referring to really exposures to information that are separated out in time. So you can see here that, uh, let's see if I can get my pointer here. Yeah. If you are exposed to category A, 
at the very beginning of an interleaf schedule, you may not encounter category A again until perhaps several minutes have passed. Same for category C, category B, and so on. The different exposures to a given category are separated out in time. And there is an abundance of evidence from psychological literature that when you are learning information, if exposures to that information are separated out in time, you don't concentrate all that information exposure in a short period of time. You spread it out over time, you come back to it later. That also can enhance learning. So these are two possible accounts. Interleaving may, just by virtue of having you switch between categories, foster this sort of discriminative contrast, learning to tell one category apart from another. Alternatively, because you're switching, you don't come back to a given category or given topic, actually, until some time has passed. And that time that has passed may also be enhancing learning. So these are two of the main theoretical accounts of why interleaving may be helpful. So where do we go from here? Well, so far, as I mentioned, most of the research on interleave practice involves visual category learning. The new frontier in interleaving research is to explore beyond learning to identify pictures. Okay? And so, for example, there's some uh, very, very promising work. This is especially prominent by a research team out of the University of South Florida led by Doug Rohrer. And he has done a series of studies investigating secondary school students and their learning of algebra and geometry. And in this particular case, uh, he's interleaved their homework problems or blocked them. And uh, there have been a series of promising results showing that interleaving of these homework problems can be beneficial for mastering geometry and algebra skills. I myself have conducted and published a series of studies recently on second language grammar learning. So for example, people learning to conjugate verbs in Spanish, French, and other languages. Typically in a second language course, uh, students will focus on one grammatical tense, one particular skill at a time. They'll use a block schedule. And in a series of studies, I've interleaved the schedule of learning uh, different grammatical skills. And there has been really promising evidence there that interleaving is helpful for grammar learning as well. And that brings me to this latest study, which is one of the first studies of interleave practice in undergraduate classrooms. And it's certainly one of the uh, first, perhaps the first study to investigate interleaving in the domain of undergraduate physics. And this is a study that was conducted in collaboration with uh, an assistant teaching professor, Josh Samani, a good friend and colleague of mine in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. That's actually where this study was conducted. Uh, and this study was uh, done from January to March in 2020, right before uh, coronavirus shut everything down and uh, we wouldn't have been able to conduct the study otherwise. So this particular study took place in two sections of a course that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Somani was teaching at the time. Physics for Life Science Majors is the name of the course. It covers a variety of topics uh, ranging from electricity and magnetism to practical applications of various physics concepts. And this particular course, uh, he taught it through uh, lectures on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the lectures were 50 minutes long. And there were two sections of this course. So one, I think, was uh, maybe just a few minutes before the second. So he actually taught approximately a two-hour block where the first block was one section of the course, and the second block was the same uh, course, but a different section. So he was teaching the same lecture twice every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And students taking physics for life science majors, they also uh, completed a weekly lab and discussion section. So we conducted this study in both sections of this course. The enrollment was similar in both courses, about 170 to 180 students. And in the study, all the students participated at the outset, uh, but uh, 
we pre-registered this study and uh, we would would only include students that completed all of the different activities that were involved in the study. So at the end of the study, we had about 130 to 150 some students, depending on uh, what you're looking at. You know, to see, uh, as I show you the data, there are different measures. So here we have physics for life science majors, and we have the details about the lectures and labs and the number of students, and in particular, this course, uh, Dr. Samani would administer three homework sets per week. He would administer homework set Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There would typically be three homework assignments every week. And the key manipulation in this study was how those homework sets were set up. In one case, they were blocked homework sets. And in the other case, they were interleaved homework sets. So here's a schematic of what the experimental design was like. So firstly, let me uh, point out, this is section one of the course and below is section two of the course. And we ran this experiment across two stages that were identical, essentially, except for the materials that were covered. So stage one would cover weeks one through four of the course, and stage two would cover weeks five through eight of the course. And then the experiment ended there. Okay. Uh, weeks nine and 10 were not part of the experiment. So what happened within each of these stages? Well, let me show you what happens during stage one first. So in stage one, for those four weeks, students in section one of the course received what we call type B homework, which is a homework that used a blocked schedule. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. Students in section two of the course received type I or interleaved homework. And so those three homework assignments a week were either blocked, as in the case of section one, or they were interleaved in the case of section two. And after four weeks of these homework assignments, we gave them a surprise we call a criterial test, a test that assessed their learning. Okay. Now for stage two of the study, we did the same exact thing, except we switched the condition that each section was subjected to. So section one now had interleaved homework and section two had blocked homework. And then there was a test. So in essence, this study was running the same experimental manipulation twice. We did it once during stage one, and then we did it again during stage two. And so with this design, every student in either section of the study they experienced an interleave condition and they experienced a block condition. So this is sort of a within subjects design. So that's the basics of what we did. And weeks nine and 10 were not part of the study. So how did we design the interleaved and blocked homework assignments? Well, here is a chart or figure showing you how the homework assignments were designed. And let me start with the blocked assignments, which are the simplest and easiest to explain. So every week there are a variety of topics, different subjects that are covered. And for each particular subject or topic, created three, what we call isomorphic homework problems. These are Similar problems in terms of what students had to do, what they had to compute, what type of answer they had to produce. Only some of the details, some of the surface features changed. Some of the values were different. Some of the examples were slightly different. Okay. And so with a block schedule, it's quite simple. Every assignment, they would get usually three problems for each of three topics. So here we have, for example, assignment one, they would get three problems for topic A, then three for topic B, then three for topic C. And those would be the nine homework problems in that blocked assignment. Okay, it's quite straightforward. And that pattern would generally repeat throughout all the different assignments. Weeks three and four, we had fewer assignments, only two uh, per week. And uh, towards the end, there were fewer problems. But nonetheless, the same general pattern is 
evident in the blocked assignments. You're having clusters of the same types of problems together. So students would practice the same problems repeatedly, which is the essence of blocked practice. Now, let's turn to the interleave schedule, which is a bit more complicated here. It took a lot more time to set up, a lot more thinking and planning. We designed the interleave schedule such that it was never a case where students would practice the same problem, same type of problem twice. Now, overall, whether you're doing blocked homework or relieved homework in this study, for every four weeks, there were, I think, uh, 84 or so problems, but they are simply arranged differently. And so in the interleave schedule, you can see here that every assignment there was a mix of problems such that every time you try a new problem, it is something different from what you had done before. You might also notice there were actually fewer problems in the first assignment versus the later assignments. And that's because of the nature of uh, interleaving. In order to be able to mix between different problem types, you need to have introduced those problem types to begin with. And so in the first week, there weren't that many topics that had been introduced yet in order to have, say, nine different problems on the homework assignments. But once more topics had been introduced by the second and third weeks, it was, there were nine different topics on every homework assignment. Okay. So we have blocked homework assignments, interleaved homework assignments. All the students are learning the same material. They are completing the same homework problems. It's just the arrangement of those homework problems, the order in which they are completed that is different. Now, students were required to complete the homework for participation credit. Uh, they got points as long as they turned in a completed homework assignment. We also went ahead and scored them, you know, checked to see how uh, correctly students had done the homework problems for research purposes, and I'll show you the results for that shortly. Also, at the end of each homework assignment, we ask students to provide some metacognitive judgments, that is to reflect on their state of learning, to reflect on uh, how they felt about the homework assignments, which I'll show the results for as well. So just to give you a little more detail into what these homework assignments look like. So here we have uh, the first page of the blocked assignment and interleaved assignment, very similar looking. But let me zoom in on what the blocked assignment, uh, the first two problems look like. So you can see here the blocked assignment, those first two and actually the first three problems, every three problems, are the same type of problem, same topic is addressed. They are what we call problem isomorphs. In contrast with the interleaved assignments, every problem is different from the next. So students are constantly forced to switch uh, to think about, okay, this new problem I'm encountering is about what particular topic? It's not about the topic I just uh, practiced, it's something new, okay? And these are the metacognitive questions we ask at the end of each assignment. How difficult did you find the questions? Uh, um, how well did you think you learned and so on? Now, at the end of this four-week period, the Friday of that fourth week, uh, Dr. Samani would ask all students to attend what he called a review session. And he would say this is a review session to help you prepare for the midterm exam or final exam that would be coming up in the next week or so. And when students came in the classroom, he said, actually, I'm not, uh, I wasn't fully honest. This is not a review session. This is a surprise exam. And he would give them uh, exam paper like the one I'm showing you here in which there were three problems and they were drawn from the homework assignments. And these were typically a bit more difficult than the homework uh, problems. And sometimes they would combine elements of different topics together. But this was our way to assess how well students had learned after four weeks of interleaved or blocked homework assignments. <coughs> Okay, so again, that's the design where we had blocked and interleaved homework assignments. This might be a more accurate way of depicting it in terms of what the arrangement of problems was like across the different conditions, the blocked condition, the interleaved condition.
And so the overall objective of the study was to see how this interleaving homework assignments possibly affected, possibly enhanced students' problem-solving skills, their ability to solve relatively challenging problems in undergraduate physics. And so we compared the effects of those four weeks of homework assignments. Everything else in the course, the instruction, materials, et cetera, all identical across sections. Okay, so here's what we found. Firstly, I want to talk about how students did on the homework assignments. So first, how well were students able to solve those homework problems? So in the blocked condition, students were performing somewhat better. Not a huge uh, difference, but nonetheless, a statistically significant one in most cases, I believe, yes, where students in the block condition were answering more of the homework problems correctly than in the interleave condition. So you can say that students in the interleave condition on the interleave homework assignments are performing worse. Now, how about their metacognitive judgments? Well, firstly, when we ask students how difficult they thought these homework assignments were, the interleave condition, students think the homework assignments are more difficult. And then when we ask student, uh, students to report how well they thought they had learned the materials covered in the homework assignments, students who had completed blocked homework thought that they were learning better. So you see here this pattern where students in the blocked condition with blocked homework, they are answering more questions correctly. They feel that the homework assignments are less difficult and they feel that they are learning more successfully. They are doing better. They're mastering more of the materials, although their ratings are not necessarily extremely high. Nonetheless, they are higher than in the interleave condition. So these all give you a picture of what students think, how they react to blocked assignments versus interleave assignments. Interleave assignments don't seem altogether that promising from these measures. Then we come to the criterial tests. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how well students did on these criterial tests. Now, as is common with uh, many physics classes, if we scored students solely on the basis of whether they got the exact correct answer numerically, uh, the success rate would be relatively low. So it is common for, uh, for example, in this particular course, even before we ran this study, for there to be a rubric that would evaluate students' answers and allow for slight variations in the number that they might produce uh, and score them accordingly. And so these criterial tests were scored by teaching assistants that were blind to condition. They had no idea whether students were uh, using interleaved or blocked homework. First, here are the results for <laughs> students who had completed blocked homework assignments, okay? So you can see that the median, which is this dotted line uh, in stage one is a bit below 0.4. And in stage two, where the material were more difficult was around 0.2, so quite low. So we see here that this is performance after four weeks of blocked homework assignments uh, on a surprise criterial test Shall we say there's plenty of room for improvement? And now the key question was, what would happen in the interleaved condition? Here are the results. So in the interleaved condition, just look at the median score. In stage one, it was uh, a bit below 0.6, but well above that of the blocked condition. And in stage two, the magnitude of the difference is even larger. So we can see here a very sizable advantage for interleave practice. And in effect size terms, uh, st stage one and Cohen's D effect size, advantage of 0.41, and in stage two, advantage of 0.91. So you can think, uh, for example, in stage two, students scoring nearly a full standard deviation higher than in the blocked condition. So here we have very sizable uh, interleaving advantages. We also analyzed uh, separately how students did on various aspects of the criterial test. For example, 
looking at the work they had done and whether they had written correct formulas. And here we see that in stage one and stage two, the interleave condition, students were more able to recall correct formulas for long-term memory when completing these criterial test problems. And when we focus on the student, whether they actually produce the exact correct answer, exact to the certain decimal point place, there was also an interleave advantage there as well. So students in the interleave condition, they are remembering the correct information and they are also computing the correct answer more often than in the blocked condition. So we see here that interleaving homework assignments in undergraduate physics can enhance problem solving ability. These are fairly substantial interleaving advantages relative to the universe of known educational interventions. And this is the first demonstration of interleave benefit for undergraduate students in a classroom setting. And it's interesting that we saw this very large interleaving benefit despite those uh, earlier indications that suggested interleaving might not be very promising, that it has worse performance on homework assignments and students feeling that they are not doing as well. Okay, so I see here a message to move to questions as, as possible. Okay, well, I'm going to move on uh, very shortly. So... So then these patterns are emblematic of many effective evidence-based learning techniques. So let me see, um, I do have a number of slides. Let me just go quickly and I can revisit those in the Q&A if some want to. This is not just a case of visual category learning. It involves recalling and applying solutions. So it's beyond that of prior studies with visual categories. And so it might have something to do, in my view and my colleagues' view, with the spacing between materials, where, again, when you have an interleave schedule, you revisit information after some period of time has passed, as occurred in our study. And that can cause a variety of uh, benefits when you spread out learning over time, one of which is retrieving information from long-term memory. Okay, and so... Uh, just to wrap up here a little bit, uh, my recommendations, preliminary recommendations, is that perhaps if you are teaching students to learn to solve problems, they might not block their homework assignments. You might benefit from interleaving them. And to help students adjust, you might tell them about how it might be more difficult to experience interleave homework assignments. If you do that, you may re yield better problem solving skills. Okay, and um, future directions, there's ongoing research on to other topics, including in the classroom and other possibilities as well. And uh, let me just wrap up with one last thing, which is this study was recently included in a review article that some colleagues and I published last month on the signs of effective learning. And uh, that goes into more detail about the various principles that inform effective learning strategies of which interleave practice is one. Okay, and I will leave you with this final quote, which is that accumulating evidence suggests that there are some educational approaches that you might think are not very helpful for learning and might seem unintuitive but they make learning more challenging and they foster certain types of cognitive processes that are actually very beneficial for them. If you want further information, uh, I have links to this paper as well as that review article there as well. Thank you. Okay. Great, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, uh, and um, just like to see whether there are any questions that people would like to ask for Stephen. Yeah, he should be able to hear you, Gary. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. One could make a very simplified model of what happens, uh, say that the students essentially forget everything in a time span of a week or two. If that was the case, then the, in, the students following the interleave program would have more of the course within the horizon beyond which they forget than the ones who 
have all of the blocked uh, homework uh, schedule. Have you corrected for such an effect or investigated if it's there? Can you, can you say a little bit, can you repeat uh, your question again? Uh, I didn't hear it fully, sorry. Planning towards the gadgets here. I mean, you, you, could, you can make a simplified model saying that Students forget everything which is more than a week old or two weeks. Ah, yes. The time period shorter than your your experiment. And in that case, the, the students which have had the interleaved homeworks, they would have the full course within the horizon, but that's not correct for the ones which had the blocked homework uh, schedule. D did you consider such an effect and correct for it, or did you look for it? That's a very, very astute point. And yes, I do think that, uh, and we've mentioned this in the paper, that with the schedule that we used, that uh, it's possible there was an advantage for an interleave condition because of, I think, factors like what you described. And so one way we thought about this was uh, looking at the particular criterial test problems that addressed information that was very close to the criterial test. So, and that particular problem, there was still an interleaving benefit over the block condition, which suggests that the time delay from learning to the test may contribute, but isn't the sole contributor. But nevertheless, that's a very, very important point that needs to be considered, which is, uh, is a design feature where if we were to run the study with the perfect comparison of interleaving versus blocking, perhaps we would need to make the interleave condition wait a couple of weeks longer before taking the criterial test so that they would be less advantage. But I would add though, that uh, there is some work uh, I mentioned earlier in this presentation uh, with uh, the studies of uh, math learning in secondary schools, where the experiment involves giving all the students a review session to catch them up, whether they're in the blocked or interleaved condition, and then having the test occur right after that, and then one more test occur one month later. And even with a review session that supposedly helps people remember, and with these multiple tests at different intervals, there still is an interleaving benefit. So I would argue that uh, the advantage of interleaving survives beyond uh, th that the this sort of one, one, what we might call a lag to test, but it is an important factor to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, the, <clears throat> first, let me say thank you for your nice talk. Um, I wonder, like, um, if you have uh, this um, type of space repetition, automatically a student would probably forget material and need tends to invest more time each time they use approach to answer question of type A, and in total spent more time. Did you have any records on this effect, whether there is total, I mean, in total, a uh, uh, larger amount of time that was spent on preparations? Very good. Yes, uh, question. Uh, we asked students how long they spent uh, completing each homework assignment. And I believe, if I recall correctly, the data showed that students in the block and leave conditions did not spend dramatically different amounts, total amounts of time completing each homework assignment. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, I do believe that it's quite likely that in terms of the minutes spent, the students in interleave condition probably, because of precisely what you mentioned, that when they come back to a topic after a certain amount of time has passed, they really need to spend more time to reconstitute their knowledge and figure things out, that they probably did spend a bit longer uh, in the interleave condition. And then the question is, uh, is that a good or bad thing? And I think that uh, the evidence shows that actually having students revisit information later on, even if they had a struggle, and spend more time, that actually may be time well spent if you consider uh, the interleaving advantage that results uh, in the long term. Uh, now, if you're talking about whether the, a time differential results in a, is responsible for the interleaving advantage, um, that's a factor we could also control for in a future study. But I would also add that there are some studies in the laboratory setting where time is very strictly controlled in terms of how many seconds you have to view information. Certainly my language learning studies are like that. 
and the interleaving advantage is still evident there as well. But even if you give somebody, say, five minutes to study something in the block condition, interleave condition, those five minutes may be spent quite differently, right? So someone in a block condition might have a very easy time. In, uh, they've seen this just a few minutes ago. They've seen it again. They find it very easy, whereas someone in interleave condition, given five minutes, they may be spending a lot of the time in deep thought trying to remember what they had encountered several days ago. So uh, I think that is a feature of interleaving that it changes, qualitatively changes the way in which people learn. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have another question. Yeah. So in, yeah. Like, in a class that I taught recently, the, I, I, like, I would think you know, doing something like that, but I came up with the fact that the first half of the course, uh, every new topic depended heavily on the first one. So yes. it's how I deal, like half of the course, uh, you cannot solve anything on the last topic if you didn't know how to solve exactly the first seven lectures. So in some way, you have an interleave because uh, in the last one, you, you, you have to review the first the lecture one. But then it's impossible to mix this topic with all the other previously. So how, how would you suggest to interleave something like that? That's a really great point. And actually, they came up when we were designing this study. It was uh, I remember uh, Dr. Samani telling me, you know, so many topics in physics do depend on, uh, they build on off of each other. And so you it, that's a constraint on how you would design a homework assignment. I think that uh, that is a case for what some of us in the interleaving literature call a block to interleaved schedule where you start off with the limited number of topics you have, and you might focus on those, maybe even uh, focus on uh, them exclusively. And then you start interleaving them when there is sufficient material that has been covered to allow you to interleave. But even under that circumstance, even in that class uh, that you're teaching, uh, there is a version of that a hypothetical version of that where you have blocked homework where you might revisit a topic from say the first week only a couple times only when it's necessary perhaps and then there is a really strongly interleaved version of that class where the that topic is revisited at multiple points throughout the entire term and that is a more robust form of interleaving the homework assignments in, that you potentially could use that uh, at least this evidence suggests would be beneficial for learning. So I would say that, yes, within the constraints of the course, within the constraints of the materials that you're trying to cover, uh, there may still be a way to introduce more interleaving than in some other cases. Um, Stephen, we'll have to stop there. Um, yes. Lots of people have got to go and teach. Right. Uh, but, but for the rest of us, uh, we'll, we'll stay a little while longer. Um, I think we can just say uh, thanks very much to Stephen, and then we can ask a few more questions. Well, thank you. Yes, I see there was a question in the chat that uh, mentions um, it's with variation of theory discrimination of features. Uh, the, the comment was that the, the results fit with that perspective, and that it would be interesting uh, in terms of whether it might the interleaving effect might work differently depending on how much students know. And yes, that's a very uh, interesting direction that has not yet been addressed, which is the role of prior knowledge. I mean, there have been studies, studies that are approaching that question, but not within problem solving. And then the further question was they would like to know the time spans between topics, concept skills, uh, what effect would the time span would be? Yeah, and that's, that's another area that has yet to be identified, which is what is the optimal uh, schedule? You know. Should you interleave items where you re-encounter them every couple of days, every couple of weeks, uh, within the span of minutes? It's still not yet clear. Uh, maybe I can ask a question, Stephen. Uh, so do you, do you think that part of the, um, the reason for the interleave practice working is the amount of cognitive work that uh, students have to put in, uh, that they have to, um, in a sense, put in more cognitive work to do different things than to do the same thing uh, several times. Yes, I think that's actually the crux of it, which is if with blocked homework assignments, 
you have a solution strategy, some knowledge in mind in working memory, uh, perhaps with the first problem you've done, once you have done completed and solved that problem and the next couple of problems are the same type, the cognitive effort required is very, very low. Whereas with an interleave assignment, because every successive problem is on something else that is very effortful, and I would add beyond effortful, the processes that you have to engage. Uh, I, I went through it very quickly, but memory retrieval, long-term memory retrieval, and some others, for example, perhaps uh, comparisons uh, uh, of one problem type to the next, or trying to identify distinguishing features, all sorts of cognitive processes that actually may be beneficial that are part of that added cognitive effort that enhances learning. So yes, I think you are right, as we say, on the money with respect to how interleaving may be enhancing learning. So maybe just because yes. on that, uh, I was also thinking when you showed the homework results that there may be some sort of bias when you show the blocked results that they may be actually be over-evaluated. I mean, I, I, okay, I don't have a good alternative to evaluate that, but you could imagine that when you give homeworks which are very close to each other, they spend the first amount, a given amount of time to solve one, and they get the second one solved almost for free, right? Yes. Uh, so I think that's maybe boosting some of the results of the, the blocked, uh, the block. And, and this also goes to the amount of time you spent to solve the problem. So, so if I, if I just paraphrase what you've said, uh, you're suggesting that maybe our physics questions wouldn't be quite so similar. We wouldn't get three questions that were quite so similar. Right. Uh, right. I mean, in an extreme case, you would have three times the same question. Which right? are different yeah. numbers in. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they were extremely close. So I guess you could have certain, depending on how you change, I would say, like the problems, maybe the results could change a little bit. But this has was also to go to how much time they need to solve the whole set. And clearly, they, in the example you had, if they managed to solve the first one, they would be able to solve the second one, right? Especially at, at home, they have that time to do it, right? Right. So, in the interest of a pure comparison, we may have uh, actually, when I spoke to uh, my colleague on this, he was saying, well, in lots of physics homeworks, so the, the, they're, they're more mixed together than problem types. There may be already some interleaving in there uh, than uh, the pure comparison we did where we're repeating problems that are almost identical, except for some very minor changes in surface features. So yes, I think you're absolutely correct that, uh, that there's uh, perhaps an inflation of the results for the homework in the block condition because of that. Um, but what I would say is this is in interest of a the strongest possible comparison between a highly, highly blocked condition and a highly, highly interleaved condition. And so we extrapolate that's to a real world circumstance. You can think about a class where the homework problems were more blocked or less blocked. And our inference, I think, is that if you interleave tremendous amount, uh, there's a possibility of an even larger advantage. Of course, it remains to be determined, though. But interestingly, your, your students didn't feel that they were learning more. Uh, they felt that they were actually not learning as well. Yes. And so that's the challenge. I think um, block practice gives this illusion of competence. You know, I've solved it, and I can do multiple instances of this particular problem type. But that runs into several uh, illusions, as we say, metacognitive illusions, one of which is when you have solved something and just you're asked just a few minutes later to do it again, it's fresh in mind and it's easy to reproduce whatever strategy you needed to reproduce to solve that particular problem. Um, as a result, there is an inflated sense of competence. When you are using interleave schedule where you have to struggle to come up with the answer every single time, that is actually more reflective, ultimately, of the true state of knowledge that a person may have, particularly taking into account forgetting that, you know, you may know something really well five minutes after seeing it, five minutes after practicing it, but a week later, several days later, uh, then you really know how well you've learned that, not just in the moment. Have you, have you ever thought about uh, coaching students in interleaved preparation? Like, I, I will give you a personal example of, of how I was preparing for oral exam back in the days. And then, like, I had the first uh, 
the first part, I was repeating the material as it was, like a paper on my notes. I was looking on the title on the left, and I was trying to repeat what uh, the statement of the theorems and the proofs. But in the second part, like I noticed that, that if I wanted to remember a proof of a theorem, it was much easier to remember if it was just after the theorem that depend like on which it depended from. And then I started uh, like numbering the topic and I throw a dice. And that was a much more oral exam situation in which I would have gotten a random uh, theorem to prove. And in this way, it's I didn't know what I was getting. And uh, my memorization was independent of what was before and what was afterward. So in some way, it's interleaved study, which should be or might be taught to someone. You know, that's a fantastic example. I think uh, you literally came up on your own with an interleave schedule. And maybe we should use that in a study where students actually throw a dice to choose <laughs> what uh, particular topic they're going to practice next. Yes, that's exactly um, a version of interleaving. And I think what you've hit on also is uh, one quality of interleaved practice I think is quite interesting, which is that it might be a better approximation for real world situations where you cannot necessarily predict the problem type or the situation or the question you're going to get next. It's not all nicely organized and predictable. And so introducing that unpredictability and practicing in that fashion may better prepare you for the real world circumstance, whether it's an oral exam or some other test where you cannot, uh, you don't have the luxury to choose or to be told what you are going to see next. So yeah, that's that's a fantastic anecdote. Yes. <clears throat> One question. If I understood correctly, all students were in a chance forced uh, to complete uh, their homework because of the requirements uh, to pass only if you had completed it. And but I was wondering whether there's any material that uh, investigates the effects of interleaved practice on motivation of students. Uh, is, there, is there anything you could recommend, sir, in this direction? Are you asking if I can recommend research studies on that topic? I mean, is there any material that one could uh, have a look at in terms of, or, or can you maybe summarize whether there's any effects that have been observed already? In terms of how interleaving affects motivation? Yes, uh, yeah. I mean, their own motivation, like, uh, I feel I want to spend more time on this uh, type of uh, problems or subject because I feel my practice is more interesting, actually, right? I mean, this could be a hypothesis one starts with. Interleaved practice makes uh, learning more interesting and hence motivation should decrease. But then there's this other effect that it's perceived, at least subjectively, as more difficult. So maybe that is kind of not good for motivation. And I wonder what type of effects uh, are, are dominant in the end. There may be what what your your question makes me think of some study the research on what's in a study time allocation, and uh -huh. so these are laboratory studies where the participants in the study have control over how much time they want to spend, and usually it's a computer, so they they just press the button to go to the next example or or the next item, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm not sure whether the study has been done with interleave practice that directly addresses that. Uh, but there have been studies of visual category learning in which certain conditions do cause the participants to linger longer on the pictures that they're presented before moving on. And so I would suspect that interleaving would cause them to linger longer and spend more time, uh, possibly because they're more motivated to study. Uh, so, I, But that is another fascinating area that re remains to be deeply investigated, certainly for problems like this physics, uh, the yeah. class that we did the study with has not been investigated at all. Right, yeah. I, mean, I was thinking of the effect that feeling good does improve the memory capacity and, and the, the way you can actually memorize things. So, so that, was kind of the, the initial trigger for my question that uh, I will have a look at the study time at education and things. Uh, at time. So Stephen, there's uh, another class that's coming in this room now, so we're going to have to finish.
uh, but I'd like to say thank you very much. And it's it's really nice to be able to have uh, that extra time to ask questions so that everybody feels that they can and ask the question. And I'm sure that if uh, if anybody has a question that they haven't asked now, uh, that you'd be happy for them to email you. And ask you Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful uh, thoughts raised by the, those who were able to participate. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Bye. Thank you.